This is Buddhalution, the podcast that puts a path before you, but doesn't push. Welcome to this special edition of Buddhalution Podcast. Hi, I'm Jeffrey Stevens, the breath behind the podcast, and I'm so happy to have you here. If you listen to anything from me, you'll eventually hear the phrase, Beyond the Mind. Beyond the mind is a cornerstone notion of the system of mental training that I refer to as Buddhalution. This phrase, beyond the mind, means something very particular and very important to those who've been exposed to the rich body of meditative knowledge that has been available freely throughout much of the world for ages. But most of us don't come from one of those parts of the world which makes learning about Beyond the Mind and, similarly, Buddhalution so very exciting. But we don't have an easy entry point to get where this is coming from or what it is pointing to. Our language hasn't been doing us many favors. Beyond the Mind is a new concept to most of us at first, but I hope that's not a reason to doubt it or to stop listening. Beyond the mind is a real thing, a very real thing. Beyond the mind is a translation of a Tibetan phrase, Sem Le Depa. It signifies something remarkable and even noble, an elite but accessible human condition, a stage of understanding that takes work and commitment but yields degrees of humanity and maturity that mark a person as a person of wisdom. I first encountered this notion of beyond the mind in the mid-1990s when I was a graduate student in Indo-Tibetan Buddhism, dating back more than 2,000 years. I found this area to be extremely challenging and rewarding, and I was surrounded by experts, which included Tibetans who were visiting teachers in American universities. It was obvious to me that many people took these teachings very seriously as a foundation of understanding reality. And many of these same people were very impressive people to me. They're people who seem to have understood something that allowed them to just be, to be both relaxed and gentle, but also very intelligent and very involved in the world around them. Beyond the mind was a cornerstone of their approach. To life. I didn't spend much time arguing with these ideas. I just tried my best to understand them. Over the years, I tried to share with friends and family and acquaintances what I was studying. Or sometimes I'd be asked questions about what Buddhists actually believe. It's not an easy question to answer in the context of a dinner conversation, but I would give it my best. And that's when I encountered, for the first time, a style of dismissing ideas that are too challenging. Many people just rolled their eyes at the philosophical ideas they'd asked me to explain to them. Back then, I was surprised by this. But these days, I'm actually more surprised when someone seems genuinely interested. And I imagine by... Listening to this podcast, you are telling me that you are genuinely interested. So let's get going. Beyond the mind. What could this possibly mean? To many of us, this phrase means nothing. It seems purposefully vague or elusive, as if it's asking just a little too much. Beyond the mind? Really? What kind of foolishness could that be? But that's the problem. It isn't foolishness. Or it's our foolishness. Beyond the mind is a phrase that points to a domain of human expression, which we also don't have a word for, But in our attempts to translate the riches of these cultures into our language, we seem to have settled on the word wisdom. Beyond the mind is the realm of human wisdom. 
So beyond the mind isn't a made-up notion. It's not speculation. It's not theory. It's a body of human capacity. It's a body of human knowledge. And it's natural within us. It's like gravity. It applies to everything, all the time, in all conditions. Or it's like our heart. It's a critical component of us, even if we've never actually seen it. Beyond the mind and the realm of wisdom is subtle, but it's not so subtle that we need special instruments to see it. We just need to venture toward it using a well-known pathway that works today just as it worked 2,000 years ago, just like gravity worked, just like hearts beating in our bodies worked. Beyond the mind, wisdom is very much part of who we are. And in all seriousness, it's the most important part of who we are. The more we understand it, the more we approach the time-honored, endlessly repeated epiphany that it is actually what we are. But we only arrive at that through direct experience. Thinking about it is not the same order as direct experience. And for that, we have to engage a process of retraining components of our nervous system. It can be done. And doing so results in many positive changes in our life even before we directly access the part of us that is beyond the mind. The Western world, the descendants of the Middle East and the Mediterranean cultures, have developed many extraordinary things that have changed the face of the world. Some of these are tremendously beneficial and others tremendously awful. If the world comes to an untimely end, it will probably be because of us. And if the world doesn't come to an untimely end, it will very likely be because we began to explore things for ourselves that have been known for a very long time by others, namely, the realm beyond the mind. Something powerful happened a long time ago in our history, but we, in the West, weren't there. We kind of missed an evolutionary opportunity. A few thousand years ago, a group of people experimenting with states of concentration successfully isolated a function of consciousness. They were able to distinguish a separation in kind between the thinking and emotional aspect of consciousness and the part that is aware. This discovery was made possible by a community of dedicated individuals who compiled incremental advances of knowledge about how the mind operates, probably over centuries, if not millennia, and they laid a groundwork that was ripe enough by the 5th century BCE, 2,500 years ago, that it was just a matter of time before a genius figure, an Isaac Newton sort of person, would come along and quickly fuse everything they had discovered and then advance it to a culminating point. And of course, we can only tell this story because this individual did come along. His name was Siddhartha Gautama, and he was no doubt a talented individual, but more than that, he was a tough and determined one. He was a person who, as far as we know, was the first of our species to break through the barrier between mind and pure cognizance, which is what we call awareness. His achievement and the transformation it had on him was so impactful that one of the longest-lasting traditions on our earth was born, and that's the tradition of meditation. Buddhalution isn't the story of Siddhartha Gautama. There are plenty of those already categorized within what we in the West call Buddhism. Buddhalution deals specifically with the way we can train using the benefit of the knowledge and guidance of those who have come before us achieving this condition. Siddhartha Gautama was very important, but he was a person just like we are. Of course, in some ways, 
he was a person unlike anyone because he was legitimately the first really to discover this. At least he's the first that we know about. He himself made reference to others in the deep past who had probably attained this too. But we have no record of those people, and we do have a record of him. We know that this has been accomplished because people are still able to accomplish this today, following exactly his instructions. It's a legitimate form of training. It's a form of training that anyone can elect to participate in. But it's also a training that doesn't exist, or at least hasn't existed, in the West. So it's not surprising that we've never heard of it before. Gotama's breakthrough and the influence he had on those around him started a new tradition in the forests of India, which was his homeland. He was referred to by other meditators as the one who had crossed over from confusion to wisdom going beyond the mind, becoming entirely awake. He was said to be the first truly awakened one from among the ranks of meditators, something that later he clarified. He said that he wasn't the only one, he was the most recent one. Makes us wonder what kind of oral history was still alive 2,500 years ago. We have no records of anyone before him, we just have records of him and what he is said to have said. The word they used to describe him was Buddha, one who has awakened. This comes from the root word Bodhi, which means awake. So Buddha is one who has awakened. He was called the Buddha, which is kind of like calling Elvis Presley, the king of rock and roll. He wasn't the only rock and roller, but he was, in certain circles, considered the best. So he was referred to as the king. And Gotama was seen to be the most advanced and developed meditator in India. So he was regarded as numero uno. He was the Buddha. In his wake, a tradition continued based on meditation that incorporated both the earlier systems of meditation that Gotama had mastered and then the innovations that he added to it. It was called a tradition of awakening, a tradition of training in the teachings that develop one to the point of awakening, and the word they used for that was dharma a word that means teachings. Sometimes they would expand this word to include the term Buddha within it, in which case they would call it Buddha Dharma. There's actually a magazine published called Buddha Dharma, teachings that lead to awakening that were presented by one who had awakened. Buddha Dharma, awakening teachings. This group of meditators stayed in the forests of India for centuries and began to wander north and south and east and west and wherever they roamed. They made available these teachings and training systems of awakening and they became like a centerless tribe, a group that wasn't joined by blood or geography, but by an interest in this path to awakening this tribe or group came to be known as the Sangha, which translates as the gathering of awakening meditators, followers of Dharma or Buddha Dharma. So altogether, this monumental period produced three enduring components of human legacy that flow throughout much of the world today. The Sangha, the group of well-trained practitioners, the Dharma, the body of teachings that they practice, and the appearance in every new generation of awake individuals trained in Dharma. And these individuals are called Buddhas. So every generation since 500 BCE has had some fully awakened people. 
It's always been going on, and it's going on today, too. And if we want to be part of it, it's open to us. It just helps if we know that it exists. While this was going on, we knew nothing about it. We now know how to build computers. We know how to build rocket ships. But we're almost completely unaware of this parallel development within our species over the previous two and a half thousand years. How crazy is that? We weren't the first. We weren't the discoverers. And we don't own this knowledge. So that puts us in a little bit of a pickle. And look at the pickle we're in anyway. As we race toward advances in artificial intelligence, which is yet another one of our inventions that seems far more dangerous than we can live with, but utterly unstoppable now that it has begun... We surely have no more than a handful of influential or powerful people with even a partial recognition of this human capacity for awakening. No president of any powerful nation has mentioned it, at least not that I've heard. Our media doesn't even acknowledge it, at least not that I've read. You know, it's almost as if we're not allowed to know about it or discouraged from investigating it for ourselves. I don't think there's any evil intention here. It's just pure, blind arrogance. And it's embarrassing because Budolution is what we're looking for. Maybe it's the embarrassment of our situation. We're on the brink of a global catastrophe due to our negligence and the now very real question of whether we got something seriously wrong somewhere in our near history. We may be in the position of actually having to learn something important from a much less technologically developed culture, a culture that holds something that is as important to our species as language is. something immeasurably more important than bombs or smartphones or unspendable billions, none of which have any track record of creating long-term human welfare. Budolution is a journey that is open to us. We may be members of a desperate society that seems intent to go down with its own ship and take everyone with it, but we're not just a society. We're also individuals. And Budolution is an individual journey for everyone who goes on it. It's ancient, it's well-known, it's safe, it's certain, and most importantly by far, it's finally available to people in the West. In the 2,500 years of its existence, it was completely unknown for about 2,400 of those. That all changed about 70 to 100 years ago. And now, at the 11th hour, here it is. You know, we did not set this ship on fire. And it's not our duty to go down with it. Even now, when so many hopes have pulled away from us, this journey is still available if we're ready to embrace a transformative adventure and perhaps, just perhaps, change the world in the process. By all means, we can each lend a hand in helping a troubled world, but we can also go directly into the heart of our own lives and transform ourselves with certainty by discovering the awake core of our being beyond the mind, just as people have been doing for centuries and centuries all the while taking pains to preserve and pass on the full knowledge of how this is done to future generations just like us. The point isn't to wonder, is this true or isn't it true? Wondering won't take you into this journey. Wonder may have led you to the trailhead of it, but you will have found a lot more than wonder before long. You have to do beyond the mind. You have to do the things people have always had to do to enter beyond the mind. Seeing is believing, 
So you got to hit the trail and go see for yourself. In other words, there is stuff for us to do. So let's get doing. Thank you so much for listening to this special edition of Budolution Podcast for the YouTube audience of my channel, Jeffrey the Meditator. Future editions of the Budolution Podcast will be announced in future videos. Thank you so much for tuning in to this special edition of Budolution Podcast. New editions of this podcast will be announced in each new video on the Jeffrey the Meditator YouTube channel. I look forward to our conversation. You can always leave questions or requests for future content in the comment sections of each video. I will read and respond to everything you put there, unless it's goofy. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.